What a dump. When I think of zombie takeout, I expected more. Hello and welcome to Zombie Takeout, the B-Movie and Cult Movie Show. I'm John. And I'm Scotto. And without any further ado, let's just get straight to this week's movie, which is from 2004, Howl's Moving Castle. Getting back to the anime and finally getting back to some Miyazaki. <laughs> I know, you want to cut through all of the uh, red tape that we usually put at the beginning of the show and get straight to the anime. Well, that and we just don't have any feedback this week. Oh, all right. um, yeah. And a little announcement at the end, but you know, we'll get to that later. Um, right. On, and, of course, that brings us to the impromptu plot summary sponsored by Aging. It's not for the young. And also brought to you by Fire Demons. Siri can suck a dick. My house will be ran by a fire demon. All right. So we have this uh, young girl uh, working in her father's, well, her late father's hat shop. She's just going to uh, waste her life away doing the family business but you know it's how things used to go back then um she's wandering the streets and gets accosted by some strange creatures well when... first she gets harassed by a couple of guards yeah that's true how but... saved her from that oh that's right it wasn't the yeah i was thinking of something else i guess that's right it was the it was the guards that she got harassed by that Hal came in this mystery man and played white knight with her played white knight almost wondered if he'd set it up <laughs> that's right <laughs> then the strange creatures came yeah. and, and and he rescued to follow her Hal, that too. and she kind of got stuck with him yeah and uh but of course there was a, a jealous uh, stalker of Hal's who um, who followed her and found where she was because, well, I guess they fancied each other. Who knows? I'm going to go out on, limb, out on a limb and say this will be our only Warner Bacall movie. <laughs> <laughs> it might be. It might be. Uh, yeah, the cast, so this is ridiculous. We'll get to that. <laughs> but Disney distributes Miyazaki stuff in the U.S., so they, they go for they some heavy hitters. They not fuck around, right. Um, so... <laughs> They, um, she, she casts a, a spell. I was going to say curse, but it's, I guess a spell. Well, no, she called it a curse. She called it a curse, uh, that she can, she's unable to talk about, which is, um, well, I guess that, that fits, uh, she turns her, she ages her by, uh, decades. I'm not sure exactly how many, but she's up there now. They kind of suggest she's in her nineties. Yeah, so they she puts about seventy years on her, at least, and uh, so she doesn't want to freak her her family out. And uh, who is this old woman? What have you done with our daughter? So she sneaks off on her own. She doesn't want to scare her family, so she runs away. Yeah, which it's kind of I mean, but I, I understand because you know I get the I get the panic. You I get, don't want I get the whole like, who yeah. are you? What have you done with our daughter? I thing. get the panic response, but logically, the family's going to be a lot more worried about you disappearing suddenly than suddenly yeah. turning old. And uh, so she's out in the wasteland, um, which a place she's not, she, nobody should be apparently. Um, but she's out there, even though she's like ninety, and um, runs into her first, uh, her first companion. The scarecrow that uh, she it looks like he has a turnip head, so she calls him turnip head. And um, the the scarecrow actually manages to help her out quite uh, nicely. Um, I love turnip head because he doesn't have a single line of dialogue in any language, right? But they still give him a personality somehow. Yes, he's very happy and bouncy and just you know. Um, it's just so anime, just the whole bouncing, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the bouncing scarecrow. <laughs> but uh, he leads her to Hal's uh, moving castle and helps her get in. And, um, well, first they, of course, wonder, how did she get there? <laughs> but uh, That she... was not her beautiful house. <laughs> right, right. 
uh, this is not my beautiful wife. Um, she um, she poses as like cleaning lady and and pretty much finagles her way in and uh, gets in all of their good graces except for maybe um, for maybe the fire who's the one running the house. But she makes a deal with him. Yeah, she does. She takes advantage of that deal. Um, but you know, what choice does he really have in the matter? Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, she's there, she's cleaning. Uh, but then this war breaks out and, uh, things start getting ugly. Uh, different powers want Hal's help. Um, uh, Hal decides to respond to, uh, one of the, one of the answers, which that was his mom, right? The, um, or, or his mentor. His mentor. She trained him. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Solomon. Mrs. Madam Solomon. Madam Solomon, who um, that's where she picks up her her Toto, her dog, mm-hmm. <laughs> and because uh, I was kind of like, oh, where's the lion and the Tin Man? And uh, yeah, it, kind of. The, but but she, yeah, and you know, she needs a dog, and yes, that's where Toto is. Um, I thought I do wonder if the Witch of the Waste. Although I guess she's the Wicked Witch. The witch while. of the waste. <laughs> she kind of is throughout the whole thing, honestly. Mm. Just thinking of herself and just uh, taking Sophie's kindness. Um, they um, so there's this war, but he doesn't want to get involved in any of it because he doesn't want it to consume himself. And um, and of course, it's just an ugly war. He'd just rather see it over than prolonging it. But uh, he really can't stay out of it because it's coming to him, you know. It's it's yeah. they're they're bombing things. It's a kind of a, I guess, a World War II aesthetic with the mm-hmm. same as if there were magic going on at the same time. It's sort of fantasy mixing with steampunk. Yes, yes, it is. And uh, so I. I Without, uh, I guess, giving away too much of the ending, we almost don't want to say hilarity ensues, but yeah, okay, because uh, it gets a lot more complicated. I was wondering where how you were going to handle the plot summary, but that's a fair point to say hilarity ensues. I mean, it's uh, I, I mean, yeah, the general gist of the plot is that he is trying to end it and stay out of it at the same time, and she's trying to save him, <laughs> <laughs> and it just keeps going from there. And the witch of the waste is trying to get his heart, and right, the Adam's witch of the waste wants to to get his heart back. Madam Solomon's trying to draw him into the war at all costs, and and, and uh, the kid just wants a uh, wants a family. Yeah, Larry and Sue's. Yeah, <laughs> just and just taking it to the very beginning because we start with the castle, and you hear castle, you think you know spires in a medieval castle. No, right. This is a hobbled together metal and brick and wood steampunk monstrosity on chicken legs <laughs> that hobbles around the countryside and it is incredibly detailed um the thing i adore about miyazaki's work is how fluid and detailed he gets if nobody tops him in that respect yeah it's it's very uh it, it's there's simplicity to this but yeah it's very you know beautifully done mm-hmm. at the same time very old school it feels the the, yeah. the whole look to it oh yeah yeah um and it's it's very pastoral and and it, there's you know magic and it's these people and, and it's it's pre electronics pre technology in a lot of ways um you know they there's no you know electricity in the houses and such right but it's very very steampunk and i'm always a sucker, sucker for steampunk <laughs> well it's everything is ran by the hearth yeah yeah in this case, well, in the, in the castle, yes, it's literally. ran by the right, hearth. Right, right. Um, I never, yeah, I didn't put that together. Nice, nice catch. Um, yeah. And the the introduction of Howl, because it's it's <laughs> been a while since I've seen the movie. I, I've seen it a few times. This is my second favorite, a very close second favorite of my of Miyazaki's work for me. Um, and he seems really creepy at first when he's well, right. you know, rescuing Sophie from the, the harassing guards. You, you said it seems like he set it up. I, I I didn't didn't think of it in those terms, but absolutely, because he is total creepy white knight guy. Right. Uh, I think, but in the end, he he didn't. That that was you know, oh, no, no. all that. But he still has that persona, and, it, and, 
and it they would have shocked it me if they did figure you know if he had oh, come off right. as arranging the whole thing but no he no. didn't he really no. did save her mm-hmm. i think they modeled him off of bowie oh that was, bowie's definitely an influence yeah um, that that hair mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, visually also, but this the film is loosely based on the 86th novel of the same name by British author Diane Wynne Jones. So it's not, a, Miyazaki didn't create a story. Um, okay. He, he took certain liberties with it. Um, he focused more on the war element. Um, he was apparently very pissed off about the Iraq war uh, the previous year, and he this was in many ways a protest. So the message was very anti-war. Yeah. Um, so... Um, so you know, it, it was very changed, but I don't know if the visuals of uh, a howl were changed for se. Right? Uh, yeah, I don't know if the original source was modeled yeah. off of Bowie, but I, I'm actually I very feel, curious to read the book. Yeah, I, I am too. Actually, I feel. Yeah, I just feel that. Yeah, the, I definitely the animation see the animation model. Yeah. They yeah. were like, "Oh, let's just put Bowie in there." Um, <laughs> this... He's well. He's kind of the Prince Valiant type. Yeah, he's the pretty blonde hair, you know, shoulder length, and at least when you first see him. Um, I'm thinking the Goblin King hair and stuff. Okay, later on, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you first see him, he's got this like shoulder length kind of bobbed blonde yeah. hair and the the um, bangs, and he's very Prince Valiant without the muscles. Um, and the sh- the blob monsters. Some of the creatures in this movie are genius. The blob monsters when they come after them, they're wearing straw hats, right? Which is another aesthetic they they brought in, like 20s US. It reminded me a lot of the prisoner, actually. Yes, good call. Good the call. original prisoner, where everybody was wearing those mm-hmm. straw hats and very yeah, that gilded age look. That um, yeah. who knew how terrifying that could be? Yeah, um, and the chauffeurs uh, for the Witch of the Waste. I'm, I'm calling her her chauffeur. She had like a sedan, right. chair, a sedan coach that they carried her in. Top hats, tails, purple suits, but also kind of blobs with these. The faces that looked almost like plague doctor masks. Right. Or yeah, just very insectoid. Yeah. Just I loved how they, they loved how they moved and kind of have fluid and, and kind of creepy they were. Yeah. Um nothing I mean you, nothing worse than an insect until you make them into a blob form. It's right. like, ooh, that's even worse. <laughs> and just the cast. Okay, let's let's break down the cast a little bit. Um, the cast is just ridiculous. Christian Bale as hell. <laughs> Gene Simmons as Sophie, aged what? Sophie, and I mean J E N J E A N Simmons, not the, the actress, not Rock all not, night, not the bass player from Party Kiss. Every Day. No, no, the actress Gene Simmons. Um, I was kind of picturing him stamping around while he was talking like that. <laughs> um, Billy Crystal as Calcifer, the fire demon. I'm typically a very not a, understated Billy Crystal in this. I'm typically not a Billy much of a Billy Crystal fan, but he's perfect for the role. You know his voiceover work is good, like Monsters Inc. Yeah, true, true. You know, like him and John Goodman. That that could have been a live action movie easily with the two right. of them. Actually, yeah. <laughs> except his, they his, wanted to go for the creative, you know, look. And he he does kind of in live action tend to overplay a bit. Yes, and I think you kind of need to do that in in voiceover. So it suits him. Uh, um, not our first Billy Crystal. Remember, we did Princess Bride. Oh, right, right, right. Long ago. Um, but um, yeah, I think voiceover suits him for that reason is because he it has does. a natural tendency to overplay a bit. Um, Christian Bale went the opposite. He just completely underplayed. Yeah. Which well, was yeah, brilliant for the role. For brilliant Billy choice. Crystal, that was very understated, you know? Fair, fair. Um, for Bale, just completely underplayed Howell, which worked perfectly. He should have talked like Batman. <laughs> And Lauren Bacall, I mean, perfect in anything, but perfect for the Witch of the Waste. Good God, Bacall, Blythe, Danner, just ridiculous yeah. cast. That's what you get when you have Disney money. Yeah. <laughs> but someone that's looking to spend the money wisely and not just get well, yeah, stars to come right, in. Right, right, yeah. Um, they tend to do that with Miyazaki stuff. They go for people who are suited to the work, not the heavy hit, not the, not the box office names. Of the day, because Although they're not think selling. Christian Bale would have gotten some tickets sold for this, probably. But they don't sell them on the names of the the, the American cast because Miyazaki's already got a built-in audience. Yeah, you know, people are going to go to a Miyazaki film because they love Miyazaki's work. You're not going to sell Miyazaki to twelve-year-olds. <laughs> you know, that's true. Uh, 
And again, just speaking of of the master Miyazaki, when Sophie first changes, when she first sees herself after she she's been changed, the multiple angles of the mirror. Yeah, she's at this mirror with you know, this one. I don't know what it's called, but it's like multiple mirrors in this display. The Tim Gunn mirror. I, I don't know. Yeah, it's 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 kind of they're kind of angled, um, and the timing between all of them was perfect, showing these different angles and different movements. Loved that. Um, and then, of course, she runs away because she sees what she's become. Um, odd choice. But she finds Turnipet. I love Turnipet. <laughs> I mean, every you can give a character personality without any dialogue, I, it always impresses me. Just this big, stupid grin. <laughs> Just the bouncing around. <laughs> this, is how much I, this is how much I adore Turnipet. Uh... I actually have a figure. <laughs> And then he like becomes heroic to the, towards the end too. He's always trying to help her. But yeah, but he like almost sacrifices himself in yeah, the yeah. end. Yeah. Um, and they just they they I, I don't know how you give a character personality without dialogue, but it, it, it amazes me. Also, love Markle, the kid who works for Hal. Yeah, um, it's basically <laughs> Howell's face. He's the, he's the face man. He's the one who is, you know, answering the door and booking everything. And he's a kid who is somehow a curmudgeon. Trying to talk like Orson Welles or Raymond Burr or something. <laughs> His little disguise. Yeah. And it, even when he's at himself, yeah. he's just completely over everything. Yeah. And then you see kind of a little kid coming out of him, like, you know, a little bit here and there. Yeah. Day. yeah. yeah. But I, I just, I always love curmudgeons and to see a kid as a curmudgeon just kills me. <laughs> um, and I loved the line. I, um, she accidentally, she's kind of messing with Calcifer. She almost puts him out trying to clean. Yeah. And I love the line. I'd appreciate it if he didn't torment my friend. Because he just <laughs> says it's so low key. <laughs> but I think that's a lot of the theme of this also is about age, you mm -hmm. know, She's old, but I mean, she's really young and she's, you know, taking on the burden of being older, her, right. you know, and then he's a kid, but he's acting like he's uh, an old, you know, curmudgeon. Mm -hmm. And, and you we, know. Find, we find out Calcifer or Towel, same kind of deal. Um, right. Um, so, yeah, they do play a lot with age. And I think as I'm getting older, I'm actually appreciating the movie more. Well, yeah, because I mean, it's kind of it's kind of uh, frightening, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Goddamn, what's gonna happen to us? <laughs> right. It's um, already happening. And I, I just have to again geek out about the detail in Miyazaki's work because the bathroom. She's cleaning uh, the house and she goes into the bathroom and it is just disgusting. The multiple colors. Just all over the place. It was like something from uh, something out of Mandy, almost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just completely run down and filthy and disgusting, and the detail is be beautifully so. Um, also, when the castle is walking along along the cliffs, and she looks down, <sighs> the sense of depth was terrifying. And uh, like the scene where he takes her to the flower fields, it's just, mm -hmm. I mean, just, <laughs> he just went to town. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like, how long did it take to even put that stuff together? It's just, well, it is a lot amazing. of CG. A lot of it is computer it? generated. Yeah. Okay. It's not, it's not all hand drawn. I was a bit disappointed to read that, but you can tell with, particularly with the castle, that has to be CG. Yeah. There's no way to, do, to get that kind of detail and that kind of movement in, in, so, um, so yeah, it was a lot of computer generated stuff, but it's still beautiful art. It still looked, yeah, it's still um, looked beautiful, which I and, guess is what the important thing is in the end. Yeah, and, and speaking of going whole hog, um, we get this great contrast between the castle at Star Lake, this beautiful idyllic setting, and then Howl in bird form flying over these burning houses, you know, fighting yeah. the war. Um, there's this amazing contrast. I'm wondering though why, um, she reverts back to her youth here and there. It's uh, it had to do with her emotions. Although, yeah, I okay. swear when he was looking in on her when she was sleeping, Being that was the first again. time we see her young. Yeah, since the beginning, right? Yeah, she's suddenly young again because he, he he's being a creeper and watching her sleep. 
but and, it's just like you know, a brief her, thing. But yeah, she she reverts apparently because that's the first time we'd seen her sleep. She apparently yeah. refers to her original age while she's sleeping, and then yeah, as she falls more in love with him, she starts looking younger. Um, and I just loved how his you know kind of tough guy, not tough guy in the, the macho sense, but kind of together, you know, unemotional facade was just shattered the minute something went wrong. Like, yeah, he, his whole thing was that he was walling himself off mm-hmm. from everything as much as possible. Yeah. And she, she there's only with, so much that could last. She messed with this potion somehow. Maybe just re- she just, he just rearranged them. So he apparently <laughs> used them in the wrong order and his hair <laughs> turned orange. And he just becomes this pathetic mess. Just completely loses his shit over orange hair. <laughs> Which could have very well been another Bowie reference because he had the the spiders from Mars. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> um, and then um, Calcifer, I was Calcifer or Markle? I think it was Markle mentioned that he lost it again. He had previously lost it like that because a girl dumped him. Yeah. So he is just this pathetic man child who was yeah. trying to put up this front. I loved that. Yeah, he's really a teenage boy at heart because that's when when he oh, lost yeah, it. Yeah. True, true. Um, he literally turns into slime while having a tantrum. <laughs> and and um, I, I loved the line. Um, I'm such the one I, I had. This was one of my intros. Um, I'm such a big coward. All I do is hide. And this magic is just just to keep everybody away. I can't stand how scared I am. It's beautiful self awareness in the middle of the movie. Yeah, it's a little on the nose, but just to have him show that kind of sudden self awareness, I loved. Um, and then she he convinces Sophie to go to the palace for him because they want an audience. They want basically when I try to talk him into joining the war, or stepping up his his efforts in the war, he convinces her to go as his mother alone. Right, and I loved the dog. Right, the dog She's just followed by this adorable little dog the whole way. Yeah, the dog actually like makes you know helps her at points, mm-hmm. and and she assumes it's him. Right, yeah, she assumes the dog is Hal. Um, it's not. I loved how she got to the stairs and the dog couldn't climb the stairs, so she had to carry it. <laughs> They're having this race up the stairs. Um, her holding and, the dog, and, and, the, and the witch of the waste just trying to walk up the stairs because she's that big. Um, and I love that her chauffeur is melting because there was a there was some kind of charm at the yeah. gate where you know you had to walk in. Um, so yeah, they're trying to, and you know they're initially racing, but then the witch of the waste just gets worn out. And I loved um, Sophie at the top of the stairs just kind of cheering her on. And the zoetrope effect. Tr- treatment or whatever it was done to the witch of the waste was incredible. Yeah, and they, they kind of revert back to that a bit with the with later with Hal they show the yeah same with Hal thing, yeah. yeah. Um, and then we get some backstory which was very nice because Hal is kind of an enigma. Yeah, so we get some backstory about how Madame Slo- Solomon trained him, and he was going to be this great wizard, and then he sold his he made a deal with a demon. Which is contradicted later in the film, unless he was training very young. Well, I don't think he was a. Well, first of all, I don't think he was actually a demon in the end. Well, no, that she says demon, and yeah, he refers to himself as a demon. He, yeah. was, he was more of a falling star, right? Um, yeah. So um, she says he made a deal with a demon. Um, Cap, uh, and this is a slight spoiler. Uh, I don't know if. It's not hard to spoil this movie because it's just so beautiful. It's you know you're not going to lose anything knowing what's going to happen going in. You're not going to lose a lot. But when he Cal- when Hal was a boy, he merged with Calcifer. Yeah. Um, and he that is presumably the demon Madame Solomon was talking about. But I don't know if he would have been training at that age. I guess maybe even Jedi train young, so maybe wizards do in this world. Yeah, they don't really say if he'd start training in the flashback. Right. Or not. Uh-huh. Um, but I loved the flashback. It was so trippy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, the, the, this beautiful, idyllic field of grass just disappears below Sophie at one point into a black hole. And yeah, um, she's just floating in it. We get the zoetrope again and the shooting stars. And it was just hilarious. It was just beautifully trippy. One And uh, um, loved the Japanese chanting music. Really reminded me of Akira. 
Now, of course, the, the scene that really puts this over for me um, is the scene where the castle collapses. Yes. <laughs> it's kind of the last stage of Howl's evolution. Yeah. Because the castle was his refuge. But just the technic, I mean, the technical oh, brilliant, way that it was visually, done. Yes, yes, it's uh, stunning. Uh, my jaw literally dropped. Yeah, yeah. It was just like, holy shit. Every little piece. I mean, there's no, there's no like ruffle cloud or anything. Mm -hmm. You see every piece just. <laughs> and they kind of give you a hint of that kind of animation later when they move it. Yeah. Because the house just radically changes. It just basically, it just redesigns itself in front of your eyes. Um, that was beautifully done. And then later we get the, um, the, the, the destruction of it, but uh, there's just some other great animation moments when Sophie sees her room and then just changes right in front of you. She de-ages. Yeah. Just beautifully smoothly. Right. She de-ages and ages in, in a lot of shots yeah. that, that really makes it interesting. And she doesn't like, they don't have her turn around to do it. Right. It just happens right in front of you. Which was great. Also loved that the Solomon's dog ended up defecting with them. <laughs> like um, they have to run away from Solomon. They take the Witch of the Wastes with her, who has now lost her powers, and the dog decides to go with them too. And at first, you think the dog is there as a spy, but nope, the nope, dog nope. just uh, along for the ride. Though I have to wonder if Bird is Howell's true form. I don't know. I thought it was a, a very a nice manimal reference. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, is he actually is? Is that what he naturally looks like, or is he more human? Because um, how or uh, Calcifer says at one point, the more you change, the harder it will be to turn back into a human. Hmm. So, and and it seems like when he was distressed, he turned into a bird. Yeah. It could have been that he just changed into it so many times that he's lost his humanity. Hmm. Loved the um, battleship designs, too. <laughs> they, they're very weird, the ship designs. These flying behemoth battleships, steampunk behemoths. Um, I was kind of shocked that the bomb actually went off when Sal was trying to rescue Sophie from it, though. Yeah. Because the bomb's dropping pretty much right on top of her. Yeah. He dive bombs to try to stop it. It hits anyway. You don't expect that to happen in this kind of movie. Uh, yeah, just all sorts of uh, disaster there. One of my few very, very minor criticisms, though, um, aside from the one line being a bit on the nose, um, is how I was saying, explaining, basically, we're getting to Howell's evolution and how he's, you know, learning to, to exist for more than himself and yeah. growing up. Um, he says um, she, she's trying to stop him from going back out into the war. And he says he has to because now he has something to protect. And then he has to throw in, it's you. <laughs> like, we didn't already know that. I guess for, for something like this, though, you have to be, you know, you have to kind of spell it out. Yeah, I guess. Um, it's, it's interesting because Miyazaki stuff is often geared toward kids. Yeah. But I feel like this one is more, has an older demo. Like, I don't think this is a kid's movie, per se. I think this one is geared more towards adults. So, I think he I'd, left it open. You know, I mean, it's certainly appropriate for kids, but I don't think a kid would really fully appreciate it, except maybe on a visual level. Um, I do think, and and you know, it is a fairy tale, but I think the ending was a little too convenient. They just oh. kind of wrap everything in about five seconds. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know where it could have gone after that. Once, once you, uh, there's nowhere else it could have gone. War. I mean, you know, the war. Well, the castle is destroyed. Is de completely destroyed. <laughs> yeah, it's a plank on the legs at that point. <laughs> um, and and they've they've um turned they've they've taken the curse off of Turniped, uh, and, and uh, she's completely back to being young, except with gray hair. Um, Hell has been resurrected and given back his heart. It's just. It, that's the natural ending. It just all kind of happened in about five seconds at the end of the movie. 
Yeah, I don't know how they else they could have done it though. You know, yeah, yeah, how could yeah. they have true? And it's a very minor, it's not even a criticism, it's just kind of like part of okay, the story. We're done. Yeah, yeah. It just happens a bit suddenly. On the sequels and remakes? On the sequels and remakes. I'd love to see this done live action. Ooh, that's uh that's it's a tough. challenge. It's a challenge. But I I would love to see it, and I would love to see Matthew Vaughn take a shot at it. I mean, you lose kind of the the visual appeal, I think, you know, that this yeah. film has the way it is. I just don't want to keep saying "Don't touch it," like I typically do with me with classic anime. Um, don't do don't animate it. Nobody else should do an animated version. <laughs> right, right. Uh, and don't do a seek an animated sequel unless Miyazaki comes out of retirement and wants to do a sequel. Like, there's plenty of his other stuff that I I wouldn't mind seeing live action. I'm kind of you know Akita. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of curious as to how that'll play out, but. Uh, well, I'm kind of curious because it's so challenging. I want to see if someone can pull it off. But this, you know, th this feels like this is supposed to be a cartoon. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know? Um, yeah. It has that very old Hansel and Gretel look, true, you know, true. to it. I'm trying to think of, like, the, the cartoons that I'm even thinking of from, like, the 60s or 70s that right, right. he's going for, but in a much yeah. more detailed way well, because the people the characters are fairly soft yes um, the backgrounds are insanely detailed yeah which is common with miyazaki but it definitely fits that style and that setting to have these kind of soft focus characters so yeah, i just couldn't see uh i just couldn't see this as <laughs> live action i i don't know if i could see it i just want to see somebody try it <laughs> to see if they can do it it's more of the challenge angle jack black is how yeah, I, I don't know. How is a tough yeah, call? Right. I mean, obviously, you give Billy Crystal Thompson Bale. for. He might be a little too old. Then again, yeah, he, he doesn't have really age. Yeah. Anyway, on the brains. On the brains. It's Miyazaki, and it's my close second favorite Miyazaki. So obviously, I'm going five. I go five as well. It's uh, such a. Uh, I don't know. There's there's so much such a heartfelt story, that that you know feels original. You know. Mm. And uh, yeah, I don't think it was just because it was a cartoon. It's supposed to be a cartoon, but I, I think they handle a lot of different themes very elegantly in this. Yeah. So, all right. So, what have you learned? Getting old is really worse than I thought. I <laughs> thought it was pretty bad in the first place, honestly. See, but the theme of the movie is that she she learns to appreciate getting older, you know, and that's what yeah, ultimately... but she doesn't fucking stay old she goes back right, to being right. young as soon as she yeah, fucking yeah. again <laughs> and then she was the first to do the dyed gray hair thing yeah it was a fad recently i didn't know, didn't know it went back to 2004 yeah that's what i've been doing mm. and i learned that <laughs> making a deal with a demon isn't necessarily always a bad thing all right so just a quick announcement um we're gonna be very sparse over the summer of course you've got some stuff coming up so yeah. We're going to be, after next week, we're going to be taking, like, I, I think we'll just go with four weeks off. Yeah. Come back in mid-July, do a couple weeks, first two weeks of August off, come back in, in mid-August for two weeks. So up until September, there's, like, five more episodes, just Something so you know. Like that. Including our 400th. Yes, that should be somewhere in August, I think. Yeah. Um, and, of course, that's it for House Moving Castle. Until next time, we will finally be reviewing Saturday the 14th. Wow. Something to, you know, put, tide you over for the month off. There. Yeah. Until then, of course, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you there are. There you are.